I would love for you to tell us your story of what happened from getting from being a biology major. Do we have any biology majors here? Okay, a handful of biology majors. I was actually, I did my PhD in neuroscience, so I'm a biologist okay. as well. Mm -hmm. And uh, how did you go from that to starting 23andMe? Can you give a little bit of a snapshot of your story? Uh, sure. So I... Um, I think the real, like, that's the advice I give to young people now. Like, the reality is whatever you think your life is going to be at the age of, like, 18 to 22, your life will not be that. And, and so in some ways, like, the best thing you can do is just really push yourself to keep learning. And, um, and I was really lucky because my parents were people who really didn't um, worry about, like, oh, you have to find what you want to do right away. And they, like, were really supportive of, you know, you should find what you're really passionate about. So... Um, so I graduated, I was a biology major. I always dreamed, I was like, oh, I should so want to be a doctor. Like, I like, I love my pediatrician. I like sick people. Um, I love medicine. Like, I love molecular biology. I find it so fascinating. Um, but there was something that just didn't feel right. And so I graduated college, and I was one of those people I graduated with no job plan. Um, so I drove cross-country. Um, I, I was a nanny. Um, I nannied, actually, for a Stanford professor, John Donahue, um, and his wife um, in the law school. And my mom made me go to a job fair. And in some ways, like, it kind of shows how random life can be at times. But I went to this job fair, and I gave my CV to someone, and they took my CV, and it ended up being for Montgomery Securities. And she then knew somebody, which ended up being the Wallenberg family in Sweden. Um, and I know there's a bunch of Wallenberg buildings. And lo and behold, they, um, they interviewed me. I only took the job interview because I wanted the frequent flyer miles. And um, <laughs> as, like, a good scrappy, you know, Stanford brat should... Um, and, and then I took this job and like, I had no idea. I didn't even know what a balance sheet was like, and here it was like the Wallenbergs. And like, I met Marcus Wallenberg came out to interview me and I was like, I didn't know who he was. I had to meet me at printers Inc. I was in flip flops and a skirt and I was like, you get your own bagel over there. And, um, you know, it was like, in some ways, like life is very random. Um, and, and I ended up on wall street and for 10 years I was investing in healthcare companies. I didn't know anything. I didn't even know what wall street was, but I knew that it was super interesting. And I was learning every single day and learning about how, um, you know, I had this passion for molecular biology and like for me to be able to meet with like these amazing CEOs who were like pioneering the world. And like I, my first project was xenotransplantation and I would fly around the world and like meet with you know, great academics who are like, you know, trying to understand whether or not you could transplant animal organs into humans. Um, and so at some point I realized like I wasn't, um, not that I wasn't learning, but I felt like the healthcare system was not reflective of my values. And I got into investing and I got into, um, you know, the whole business because I was learning, like, it was so interesting. And I love like the potential of like, oh, we're all going to live better and it's going to be better, healthier lives. And then after a while, I started to realize that healthcare is this like amazing money machine. And you know, it's $3 trillion. It's the largest part of our economy for a reason. There's so much money in healthcare. And I would have um, meetings with people who were, you know, CEOs who were like, oh yeah, you know, we're seeing margin expansion because we're really good at collecting from the uninsured. And, and you're like, oh, like that, you know, margin expansion is good, but like the fact that you're like squeezing poor people like doesn't sound great. Um, and, and so I just felt like there was like this ethical debate for me. And so in some ways, 23andMe came out of um, this frustration that like I saw that, you know, the healthcare system was not reflective of me. And I spent probably a year um, just shorting stocks, like, you know, in your anger. Like I was like, I'm just going to short everything. Everything failed. It all sucks. Um, and, um, and I sat with this one professor and we were talking about, you know, it was obviously at the early days of Google. And that was on my mind and had sort of this discussion, like, well, what if you just had the world's health information? What could you do? He's like, well, you could solve everything. I was like, well, then we should do that. And, um, and it was the beginnings of the social networks and, um, you know, crowdsourcing and, you know, MySpace. And, and it was this idea, well, what if, like, everyone, like, we all have a common interest in our health. Like, you look at Livestrong and Susan G. Coleman and all these groups, like, people come together and they care. So, like, why don't we just all come together with our health information. I don't need pharma, and I don't really need all the specific academics. Like, we can crowdsource the world's largest study and empower each of us with our information. Like, let the people rise. And why is it that your healthcare system is like, why are they all telling you what you want? No one ever asks you. And so, like, 23andMe came out of a rebellion. And in some ways, like, we've always meant to be a rebellious brand. It was always about, like, I want to change the whole system. 
And the beauty of Silicon Valley is that you can be totally unrealistic with your expectations of what you can do. And, and I really believe, like I tell people in the company all the time, I'm like, we really can topple a $3 trillion industry. Like it's gonna be amazing, like little old 23andMe, but like that's what we're trying to do, like start a revolution. And um, so, you know, 23andMe came out of that sense of like, we're super, I was super frustrated with the industry. I was very clear seeing that the consumer has no power, um, that there's a potential for crowdsourcing. And I was fortunate to have sort of, you know, the Stanford upbringing and this Silicon Valley community that was really supportive of like, think crazy thoughts and like follow your passions and it's okay to fail. Like everyone fails at different times, like do it. And I think that, you know, then it came 23andMe. I love this. I love your passion. And this is such a fabulous story, first of all, about the serendipity, but also how once you found your passion, you dug in deep. Now, 23andMe was such an early, early player in this game. I remember when it started, and this was sort of in this gray market. You know, there were the regulations weren't there yet. Mm -hmm. Maybe even the science hadn't quite caught up with what you were trying to do. The market certainly wasn't there. Which was most difficult, and how has that changed over time, the technology, the market, and the regulations? Uh, so the, the thing that has changed the least, ironically, is the technology. We're actually still using the same platform. Um, one of the things that happened when I was, um, you know, when we were looking at starting the company is I was, I would do um, calls with experts. And I called somebody at the Broad. And, and I remember him saying, he's like, you don't understand. He's like, the enthusiasm we felt in 1999, like we feel it again. Like the whole world's going to change. And it was because Affymetrix had introduced this whole genome chip. And suddenly you could get like all this genetic data and it was somewhat affordable. It was like $1,000 a chip. And it was like, it was so cool. He's like, we're like kids in a candy store. It's like the potential is all there. And so um, that, in some ways, like hearing that enthusiasm, the potential, that to me was a sign. Like we should start the company now because like it's cheap enough and you can really get all this information. Um, so the technology is the one thing I'm really grateful for. Like it's Illumina has an amazing product. It is reliable. It works. They drive the cost down. It just gets cheaper and cheaper. But we're on the same platform that we started with. Um, the regulation, um, in some ways, the regulation and the consumer market, those are two things. It's almost, um, like I was lucky, from the investing world, I learned, like Amazon, back in 1998, we used to have these discussions all the time, like will consumers really put their credit cards online? And in some ways, like that seems so crazy now, but that was the discussion. Like we would debate it. Like, will they change their behaviors? People want to see a good, how would you buy something online? Um, and so I, in some ways I had this support, like when 23andMe launched, the consumer was not ready. And, and to this day, after 11 years, you know, the consumer is now starting to get it. Um, but people have no idea why you would want your genetic information. And our, our society trains people in that sort of communist sense of like, you should wait for Big Brother to like tell you what to do. Like if, if it's important, then your doctor will tell you what to do. Um, so we've been, in, and it's one of the things I've learned, like if you're changing society and how people think and how they work, you have to have patience. And so it's part of it is that you can't do a marketing study and I can't go and like have, you know, you know marketing people out there trying to figure out like what do people really want? They don't even know what they want. Like we have to try and fail and try and fail. And like, and I can see in my mind this world of like consumer driven affordable healthcare. And, and so we have to sort of create that. Um, the, so we have to teach the consumer. So the, the regulatory side, when we launched, we believed like really simply, um, I own myself, like it's my body and my genome is just the digital representation of me. And so like, of course I can get access to it. Like, why would I not be able to? That seems crazy. Like, why would there be any prohibition? And then um, my taxpayer dollars go to all this genetics research. So why wouldn't I be able to get access to that? Like, all I want to do is connect my, my, my own body, my genome, and, like, understand what's happening with all this research. And, like, I already paid for that research. Like, I want to see what it is. So the idea was like, we're not interpreting, like we're just, we're connecting the dots for you. And, sorry, I was like cold. Mm. And so we just felt like it was, it was information. It was almost like this is your first amendment, right? Like you can see. And from a lab perspective, 
we felt like we fell um, under CLIA, which is the Clinical Laboratory Information Act managed by Medicare as a laboratory developed test. Um, and so, you know, we, you know, in lots of blood tests, like blood tests today and most genetic tests are all LDTs. So we felt like we were under that pathway. Clearly, like one of the things that's interesting for me is like, especially from an academic perspective, the history of medicine is so interesting. And, um, you know, birth control tests used to be super controversial. And any time the consumer is at the point of interaction, like it's a direct-to-consumer, that's really controversial. So we realized like that we were just getting, um, in some, like there was a lot of controversy around us because of the direct-to-consumer. And so we did have sort of um, what's now known as the most well-read ever warning letter by the FDA's history, um, which I actually in some ways I'm really proud of. Like I think that that um, was a sign that we're like doing something really different. It was sort of radical. Like it's the change that we want. And our approach to it has been to work with the agency and say, you know what, like trying to fight with the agency or like sort of that arrogance of like, well, we'll show you. Like part of it is that you, to really drive change, you have to change the system. And so for me, the best thing that we've done is then partner, it's, partner's not the right word, but that we actually listen. Like we listened to the FDA and we said, we're going to do all the things that you ask us to do and we're going to get a direct-to-consumer approval for our test. Okay. This all sounds great, mm -hmm. and this I'm I'm all in. But there have to be some interesting ethical considerations here. Mm -hmm. I mean, once you give people this information, first of all, the question of what do you do with it? You've mentioned several times. You know, essentially, this data is also going into some central place and being used for research. So there's who owns that data, and do you own the data? And also, then what happens with people who get information that they don't actually? Maybe it's not actionable. Maybe they get things that uh, scare them. You know, what do you think about from an ethics perspective? Yeah, so we, is Hank Greeley here? <laughs> no. He's um, across campus. He's across campus, but you know him. Yes. Um, so Hank, um, Hank is a Stanford ethicist. It was funny because like in the early days, we recognized there was going to be all these ethical issues. Um, and we couldn't get an ethicist to work with us. Um, and... Um, you know, in some ways, like, ethicists were like, no, 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 this is, like, groundbreaking. Like, we're going to just, um, you know, comment, um, you know, from afar. And, and it's true. Like, there's been a lot of really interesting um, sort of ethical questions that have come out of this. Um, my approach to it has been um, sort of, like, there, there's a reality, there's, like, truth that comes with your DNA. Like, I can tell you whether or not you are related to your family members. And so the same way it's not fun to get a cancer diagnosis and there's no easy way to couch that. Like sometimes you just tell people, like, or we make the data obvious, like you're not related to your father. And is there an ethical debate about whether or not you should or shouldn't do that? Like I'm just a big believer that that was consumer choice. And um, I feel like there's there's truth about you that you should just be empowered to learn that about you. There's really interesting ethical debates in that, like, you share DNA with all of us. You share DNA with me. You share DNA with your whole family. And so you might want to learn something, but your sister might not. And so how do you, like, you might learn that you are a carrier for the BRCA mutation, mm -hmm. and your mother learns that she's a carrier for the BRCA mutation, and now your sister knows she has a risk factor, but she didn't want to know. Um, so I've just kind of put that all in the bucket. Like, you have a choice to learn about yourself the same way, like, you have the right to ask about a family history. Um, you have the ability to learn other things about, like, go and get a test on your own. So the reality is, like, we all share DNA in common, but we're about empowering you, and there's definitely considerations that I need to empower you with so that when you are getting this genetic information that you are aware. And we spent over a year with Hank and others on the consent form, um, you know, making sure that we were, you know, as thorough as possible, helping think through what are all the different things that can she come about with it. Um, and I would say after 11 years of doing this, um, the number one thing that is with it is with family is, you know, you might not want to know something, but your sibling does, um, or you find out that you're not related to, you know, there's a lot of secrets that went to the grave that suddenly on, are unearthed, and you realize, like, oh, Uncle Joe is actually just Joe. And um, <laughs> um, so there's all kinds of things like that that people start to, um, people start to learn. And, um, and we've always just kind of that approach, that, like, the best way to do it is just to be really candid. And I think we have a brand that is very direct and very honest. Um, and, and is what I've always said when I worked in hospitals, like there's no easy way to tell someone you have stage four cancer. Like 
the best thing you can do is be sort of, you know, factual and, and then help make those decisions. And for me, the, what we try to do is be very, like, give people the information and then create a community around it so people can start to understand what to do. But let's just talk about privacy then, right? Because now the information is out there. It exists in the world. Who owns it? And the consequences for me might be one, one thing, but if the insurance company knows or if the government knows or my employer knows, there might be some interesting consequences that are unintended. Can you talk about that? So we do everything we can right now to protect your privacy. Um, the reality is, like, I'd love to see your genome. I'm sure it's wonderful and beautiful. <laughs> um, but the part of the reality is that your bank account is a lot more interesting. And the banking, like, so when I think about people, like, the desire to hack in and see, like, oh, you know, you might have blue eyes. Or, you know, you might be the high, most salient. Like, like you might have um, a high risk factor for Alzheimer's. It's just not such a motivation to hack in. Um, and it gets back to, in some ways, some of the ethical questions is that it's potentially more within a family. Um, even the insurance companies, like when we talk about insurance, like one, right now we, we will never give your information out without specific individual level consent. Um, but in insurance, we have the question, will insurance companies hack in? I'm like, well, you know, it would be unusual for an insurance company to like break a law to try to get information about a risk factor that they don't really have any great models built around. And um, plus, we also have this thing we don't have legal chain of custody on our customers. So meaning that if you ordered five kits, I have no idea if you ever spat. So from a privacy perspective, like I don't actually know that you are you. Like I didn't actually see you spit. It could have been, you know, your five friends yeah, yeah, yeah. spat. It just went to your address. And so I don't actually have a legal chain of custody on my customers. So I think that actually gives a fair amount of, um, you know, like I said, we do everything we can to protect the privacy of customers. But again, we spend a lot of time with privacy experts, and it was really ingrained in me that, um, or hammered into me, that privacy doesn't mean not sharing, and that privacy actually means choice, and that people will say, like, I want to have the choice to say, no one sees my data, or I want to have the choice to say, all my family sees my data, or make it public, that we want to enable choice, and we need to do everything we can to respect your choice. I don't want to share it with anyone, and we need to respect that but I also need to respect your choice of saying, I want to share it with my whole family. And so we've enabled those kinds of sharing abilities um, with all of our customers. In terms of the research, um, we do consent. We ask our customers if they want to consent for research. So it's an opt-in. Over 85% of our customers today are, in fact, opting in. Um, and what we find is similar to this sort of goodwill nature of Susan G. Komen, like, people want to, people want to help. You know, there's no such thing as a healthy person. Like, everyone has something. Everyone has allergies or migraines or I have Hashimoto's. Like, everyone has something. And so um, we all want to help each other. And we can all be empathetic to this fact that, like, you know, like my, you know, one of my good friends has cancer. Like, I, I'm, like, everyone has a story. Everyone has a friend who has something. You've all seen other people suffer. And we want to help. So, um, so the consent for us is, like, it's an opt-in. Um, we ask people then to take questions if you want, but it's always that ability. You have the ability to say, I don't want to take this set of questions, or I want to withdraw my consent. So everything for us is, again, it goes back to that definition of privacy. It's like, it's about choice. And so if you want to participate and take every single survey question we have, do it. And then we will tell you what you participated in. If you don't want to, then don't do it. So do you consider yourself a biology company or a data company? Data. Data company. So what do you do with all this data? I mean, yeah, I'm going to guess you have, how many data scientists do you have working with you? A lot. It's my head of, um, of people. Um, <laughs> a lot. Um, the answer a lot. is a lot. Okay. Well, I think it's probably, uh, it's a fair amount. I mean, we have over 100 PhDs. We're over a third sort of PhDs. Sorry, I hate to bug someone. I just have to get more water. There's some right here? Yeah, I'm just going to, I'm going to go through that. Just wait. Just okay. Wait. Well, the more yeah. we have, there is more water on awesome. campus. Super. So, um, great. <laughs> hydrate. Hydrate. Um, they, sorry, I don't want to start coughing like crazy. Um, so we have, I mean, what we do, like, we see ourselves as a data company. And I think, especially speaking to this kind of crowd, um, you know, the, the whole new world is about how do you use data? Like, we see what Google can do. We see what Facebook can do. We see what, you know, Netflix and Amazon, like, 
all these things are, are based on data of, of customers. And so in some ways, I look at this as a tragedy that the most important thing is not like what movie you really want, which is very important. Um, but, <laughs> but when you go to the doctor, use your data to tell me what's likely to happen to me. Like, I find it crazy that we have this mentality where we, we absolutely accept, you know, oh, you're diagnosed with something. Like my friend diagnosed with cancer. Let me go and get five different opinions because there's not consensus. Like we don't actually have the data to know what is the right thing to do. And so what we want to do is like use our data to really transform healthcare. And so we have, I see us as like we're a data company. And the first thing we started doing was publishing. We have over 80 publications. We try to collaborate with as many different academic and pharma groups as we can because we feel like your data is really valuable for you, but like, like, and it's valuable for one study, but you could participate potentially in a hundred studies. And our, our customers, we've actually seen that the average customer has participated in over 200 different research projects. So we're really about trying to empower people to participate more and more in research. So one of the next things that we do with data is we hired Richard Scheller, who used to be at Stanford. He has sat in that chair. Oh, did a he? A few years ago, yeah. At this talk? Yeah. Oh, did exactly. he? When he was at Genentech. Aww. Yeah, exactly. So cute. Um, <laughs> Richard. <laughs> so he we was, hired. Yeah, he was my professor when I was a student. Oh, really? Yeah. Richard, Richard's is a lot of fun. Um, <laughs> he tortures me all the time. Um, mm, so one of the things that I like also really frustrated me on when I was on Wall Street is that we have this horribly inefficient drug discovery process. Um, it's potentially the only group I know that actively promotes how they get worse every year. Like, if you notice, like, when I started investing, it was $700 million to make a drug, and now it's $2 billion to make a drug. Like, it's crazy. Like, it's crazy that, I mean, this is where it reminds me of the communist era, of, like, where you actively promote, like, how much you are worse every single year. So <laughs> something is wrong in this system. Like, we, like, I, like the whole approach, the myth, like the mythology, like something's wrong. Um, so my hope was that if we actually started with a giant human data set and you're getting insights from humans instead of potentially animals, would you actually have a higher likelihood of success? And I think that's where we've actually, um, like I don't have the ability to say yes yet, but my hope that is in 10 years, I'll be able to say, hey, by starting with a massive, massive human genetic database, I was able to develop drugs faster, better, and cheaper with higher outcomes than the rest of the industry. And so that is like one of the main things we're trying to do with this data is like how do we actually develop insights in our biology and then turn that into potentially therapeutic. Like we publish papers and then also develop therapeutics. And one of the other things I'm also frankly most passionate about is that no one really pays for prevention studies. So like the whole question, you said you're neuro neurobiology, like neurologist. So like how do you prevent Alzheimer's? You know, who's, if we actually really figure out how to prevent Alzheimer's, like who's gonna make money on that? No one. So and the question there is like, who's gonna fund that study? And that's kind of the reality is like, we're all, of, like every single one of us in the room cares about preventing Alzheimer's. But if I had a whole group of pharma execs, not that they're bad, but like no one's gonna make money off of prevention unless it's a pill. And so that's what I'm really passionate about. Like, are there lifestyle interventions? Is it food? Is it diet? Like, what is it we can do? Oh, amazing. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, <laughs> oh, and a cough drop. Oh, thank you. Um, so I think that's where, um, um, that's where I think there's like, I lost my train of thought on that one. No, it's okay. It's okay. But did you actually say that you want to get into the business of actually developing therapies? Or are you just partnering with companies that do that, giving them, using your data and your Oh, no, insights? we're developing drugs. You are. Yeah, we are developing. Like, people, it's funny because I meet people sometimes. I'm like, no, we, we hired Richard Scheller, who spent, you know, 15 years at Stanford and 15 years at Genentech, something like that. And um, we, we, we hired him specifically with this idea. We want to develop drugs. So we currently have seven therapeutic, seven, seven compounds or seven targets under development. And we get the question all the time where people are like, well, did you buy them? I'm like, no, no, no. They came from the data. Like, well, did you acquire it? I'm like, no, again, came from the data. Like it's literally, it's all from our data. And so we've developed this whole pipeline of our data science. Like we, we are my consumer team. We bring customers in, we ask questions. We have a whole you know, team of PhDs in survey methodology who um, figure out how to ask questions in the right way. We analyze the data 
And then we work with Richard's whole team about how do I translate all these insights into potentially drug targets. So can you give an example? And, and, and of that pathway, because that's super interesting. Like, it is what super was, interesting. You know, where did you start? What kind of insights you got? And, and what sort of therapy are you developing? So the thing that's interesting about what we have um, done is that we don't do phenotype-specific research. For instance, I don't say, I'm going to go find people with Alzheimer's and I'm going to do a study on Alzheimer's. Like, I take everyone. Like, every single person in this room is interesting to me. And all of you have something to contribute. So... We, we follow the data, and it's in some ways, like, it's, it's really hard for people to grasp that. Like, we have, um, you know, compounds in all kinds of areas, like cancer, asthma, autoimmune, and we pick those compounds or we pick those ideas because that is where the data was most interesting. And we look at the whole story where we can do a genome-wide association study, and then we can, like, looking to see, is this genetic variant associated with these diseases? And then we can look at, oh, at this genetic mutation, people with that mutation, what are all the different conditions they have? So we can do all kinds of interesting, you know, analyses of, of the data that we have, and we're using that then to develop these compounds. But we don't start with a specific hypothesis. And in some ways, like when we started the company, that was one of the most um, controversial parts. Like I would meet with scientists and they would say, oh, this is a fishing expedition. You get enough data, you can find anything. And, and I think that's where, in some ways, for me, not having a PhD or an MD was helpful because you can think, like, I wasn't trained in a certain specific way. I just had this idea, like, a lot of data sounds good. Um, and, and so, and we've been able to show now that, like, a lot of data, especially, like, when it is collected, and I have this appreciation now for the survey methodology team, data that's collected well, analyzed in the right way, we really can get a lot of really fascinating insights. Cool. In a few minutes, I'm going to open up to questions from the audience. So think about your burning questions about the industry, the mm -hmm. company, and anything else you have. I'm curious. Let's let's zoom out to yeah. the whole industry because things, the the technology is changing so fast in so many different disciplines. What are you most excited about in this area of of healthcare and and prevention and genomics? <coughs> hmm. Well, I'm excited about us. Um, and we are too. <laughs> I'm excited. Um, what, I, what I enjoy, like I think Silicon Valley is um, really like, Silicon, like, there's, like we have such a culture. There's brilliant people all over the world. But the thing that's really unique about Silicon Valley is we have a culture of risk and innovation. And, and it just, it's helpful because like that, that becomes infectious. Like people are, like it's okay to fail. It's okay to start a company and fail. And it's not that it's not okay in all areas. Um, so what I enjoy is there's really smart people who have been through sort of the startup culture and have done really successful companies and they hit their 40s and they start to get sick um, or they know people who get sick. And so suddenly they, they become aware of health. And there's really good enthusiasm right now um, from people who I believe are willing to take risk and really willing to know how to innovate and build companies who are trying to build companies for sort of like the next generation of healthcare. And, um, and I'm optimistic. Like I'm really optimistic about 23andMe being able to partner with a number of these groups that can really be able to quickly get you data. So like some of them that I find fascinating, like um, the ability to look at all your radiology and can you scan it? Like, is there machine learning that can potentially help scan that in a much better way? Um, to me, that's super interesting. Um, there's companies like Grand Rounds where you can get, you know, expert opinions online. Um, I'm really excited about, um, so I'm excited about all this sort of like the health 2.0 world um, and, and what's happening and the enthusiasm from Silicon Valley going into that. I'm also really excited, and I think this is odd. Um, a lot of people don't get this, this sequence. Um, 23andMe has almost no partnerships with, with hospitals. Like, we have no partnership with Stanford. Almost. We have one partnership with, in Nevada with Renown. Um, but I have a partnership with every single retail group. So Target, Walmart, CVS, Sam's Club. And I look at that because, like, the future of prevention is not with your doctor, but the future of prevention is with Walmart. And the reality is, like, you... Your health and the status of you today is accumulation of what you have done every single day. So I tell my kids all the time, like every single day you're making decisions that are cumulative and they impact your health. So like if you want to prevent disease, 
you need to take responsibility on a daily basis. And where do you live out your daily basis? Like it might not be in this room, but the mis- most of the country lives it out at Walmart. The average person goes there three times a week. So if I want to drive real change in this country, I need to work with Walmart and I need to be where people are going. And the reality is like no one wants to go and hang out on the doctor for fun. Like, like that's not like I don't happen to like randomly stroll by like Welch Road and like see my doctor. Like, It's not near, I mean, it's near Stanford Shopping Center, but it's like not part of my ecosystem. And so that's for me one of the big things. Like, I think retail is going to become really interesting as they partner with healthcare. And I think that's going to become more and more of an ecosystem for us to actually get a lot of our care. So it's interesting because really, really interesting insight. And I, Mm -hmm. I think that'll be fascinating to see that play out genetics is only one thing you can look at, right? There are lots of other things in our systems that Mm -hmm. aren't necessarily embedded in our genome. It might be in our blood. It might be in other bodily fluids. Mm -hmm. You know, are you thinking about going in that direction as well, looking at other, being able to measure other things? We, so we joke and have, like, we always want more more, data. data. (laughs) Um, So we've had this debate in-house almost for 10 years now about um, two hot topics. Um, the microbiome and telomeres. Um, so the challenge here is like, like when I talk about genetics and the technology I have, like my technology platform is spectacular. Like I can't, like I'm so grateful to Illumina that they have this great platform that's incredibly, you know, reliable and robust. And I know that when I give you a result, I feel good with those results. Microbiome, I don't quite have that yet. There's a lot of debate and collection. Like, I mean, the, the discussions and like my research team, they love the debate. Like, do I need the entire sample or do I need part of the sample and what part? Like, I mean, the debate is like, is kind of fascinating. Um, and, and so I just don't think it's quite yet there. Um, there's other stuff, methylate, like there's, there's, there's a whole other world of other technologies that I think would be interesting. Um, the thing that I'm actually most interested in, and again, it goes with some of the prevention work and somewhat of our rebellious um, brand and, and even just my spirit, like I'm really, and also being in Silicon Valley where people like talk about organic and are phthalates really good for you? Or are they bad for you? Um, I would love to do environmental testing. And I did in 2008, I did a test called the body burden study where I was tested for 80 different chemicals. And it was really interesting that I was like super high in fire retardants. And, um, it was environmental working group who did it. And they're like, Oh, you must fly a lot in coach. And I was like, <laughs> I do. And they're like, yeah, that's circulated air and fabric seats you absorb more than in leather seats. And so I was like, oh, it's great. Um, Better for so, first class. <laughs> yeah, so, so it was really, and I was really high also in mercury. So I stopped, so I did a couple things. Like one, I changed out all of our furniture to get rid of the fire retardants. I stopped eating tuna. Um, but it was really interesting to just know that that was in my body. And I think there's a huge potential for 23andMe to have like, to bring truth to a lot of these um, hypotheses. Like, all, like there's, we all know, like, or we, it's all, there's data out there to speculate, like, oh, some of these chemicals are bad, but we don't really have data to say exactly how bad, or are they really bad in our lifetime? Like, they might be horrible in rats at 150 times our concentration, but like, I don't know, what does that mean for us? So I would love to actually um, bring truth to like some of these questions that are out there, like, or some of these, like, is it a hypothesis or like some of the stuff that's about our, um, you know, like what we do every day and can we actually bring some real science to that? Very cool. Who wants the first question? I have a preference for students. If you're a student, do you have any students who want to raise my hand? Oh, no. There you go. There you go. Hi, I'm Jenna, I'm mm-hmm. mechanical engineering. And I was wondering, you talked about, uh, the transition from going to undergrad to whatever you are doing right now, and then later on you talked about kids. Uh, how do you manage family and being able to invest uh, 10 years of your life on the same project? So I'm going to repeat the question for the audience. Yeah. It essentially is, okay, you're working really hard. How do you right. balance your work and your family? Yeah, so I'm lucky because my sister, my sister's life is more crazy than mine because I have two kids and she has five. Um, and we both run companies, um, and her company's even bigger. Um, so I think the thing is like, it's like one of the lessons you have as a company is that you have to like, our product success depends on our prioritization. And my 
my life also depends on my prioritization. And so there's some rules I've had. Like I, um, I stopped traveling for conferences. Like there's kind of a crazy conference world. You can go to endless conferences. Um, I only do stuff that's local or people can come to my office now. Like it's just, it's otherwise it's such a suck of time. Dinner meetings are also usually a total waste of time because you, um, I mean, it's the reality is like people usually want something from you and that you can just like ask in 15 minutes and then, then you're done. Um, and so I'm really kind of strict. Like I have to probably, like my kids want me, like they want me around. And so I have to be really disciplined about it. And the thing that's been hardest for me is I love, like when I first moved to New York, I had this mantra. I was like, oh, I'm going to do everything. Every opportunity that comes my way, I'm going to do it. And it's really hard now because I must get a handful of invites every day. And it's not in my nature to say no. And everything, I'm also like the Energizer Bunny, like everything looks fun. And I can see the potential and everything. I'm like, well, I don't know, you know, maybe going to Sweden in winter is fun. And like, it sounds really interesting. And so I've had to learn and my team has been really helpful with me of like saying like, no, like no more travel for you. Like Sweden in the winter is not good. Um, and so, so I think you have to just be super disciplined with it and, and recognize like there's some things that are fun and some things are not being like at running a company. The most important thing, like my company is also my child. And so for CEOs who are traveling all the time, you're missing, like, it's not functioning well then. Like you need to actually be there. I need to meet with people and I need to spend time with my kids. So it's just about like, you got to run it strict. Great. Do you have another question? Back there. Uh, hi, first of all, can you speak up? Um, uh, can you please, please speak up? Yeah. Um, first of all, I'm a fan. I always speak in French, and I think you're doing amazing things. I Thanks. Have one. I have two questions, actually. The first question is, um, down the line, when, uh, and, you know, if your drug story becomes successful, do you have any plans to provide recompense to the patients whose genetic data went into discovering this drug? So let's let's just say that question first. Do you plan to essentially uh, give some sort of com uh, compensation to those patients, to the, the people who uh, contributed data mm -hmm. to if there were some drugs that came out of it? And yeah. the second question? Um, second question was, what was the process of starting such a capital-intensive business like for you um, in terms of raising money? Um, did you find it like, more challenging to get people to believe in like, the risk, given how much like, you have to get a privacy services, and et cetera? Mm -hmm. Okay, so the question is, you know, the yeah. challenges of starting a, a capital-intensive um, business. Right. Um, so I'll go to the first one first. Um, so I think a lot about that. Like, I am um, frankly, like, kind of disgusted the way the research environment today <coughs> treats participants. Like, you're called a human subject. Like, at what point in time do you ever want to be a subject? Of, like, it's just, it sounds horrible. And, and I think there's kind of this mentality of like, I'm going to get you to consent. I'm going to take everything I can from you and then I'm out. And, and I just like, I, I just like, it's, it's so dirty. Like it's, and so 23andMe is like totally built around, you're a partner. If you don't like what we're doing, you're going to delete your data and that's going to screw us. Like we have totally set this up to be a balance. Like I feel compelled every time you answer a question and then there's a publication, I need to give you that data back. So I don't know what it is. Like Richard and I sort of talk about this. Like, like we have to do something to for the people who have participated in some way. There's a long, long, like we have some studies, like our, our depression study was 400,000 plus individuals who participate in that study. So there's insights from there. But then there's going to be 10 years of work to do. So I don't, I don't know what the right um, plan is. In some ways, for people, and I hear this all the time, if you're a severely depressed individual and you participate in this study, and then we discover something, and I come back and I'm like, I'm going to give you $15 for like what you've done. Like It's insulting. And even um, for people who have a terminal illness, it's not about the money. They're not doing it for the money. Like They're doing it for the respect and that they want to move it forward. So I think there's things that we should do. We recruit from our our, our, the 23andMe community all the time for studies. And so I should definitely, if I recruited you for a study, like a phase two trial, should I do something special so you don't have to pay for drugs or something like that? Without a doubt. Like there's things like that we should do. Um, I just think it's, and, and, I, and I don't know what it is, 
But our approach is always like, I don't know, but we should do the right thing. And whatever it is today is not the right thing. And so I, we're going to definitely innovate on it. Great. And the second question had to do with oh, starting my, such a capital intensive We business. were totally naive. You can never start a business saying like, oh, I need hundreds of millions of dollars. Um, you know, we were totally naive with like what it is. And like the beauty of being early is like you're just naive. And like the reality of the venture capitalists, they've like seen it before, so they know you're naive. Um, I mean, we started a business knowing that, um, you know, we outsourced as much as we could. So like our, our, our capital really went to just hiring people. And in some ways, like we had built a plan where it was like all the really expensive things we've outsourced. Um, even now, we just did a big fund, fundraising. We raised $250 million. But that was because I have this machine that's built and that money is going to go for potentially funding R&D with Richard's team on the therapeutics and a lot for marketing and for potentially acquisitions. Great. So we didn't need the capital. Another questions? There you go. Hey there. Um, I was wondering if uh, there was a plan for like proactive and preventative measures, uh, maybe using additional data sources like smartwatches, and then you could start to uh, also use that uh, with the data that you already have mm -hmm. um, to, to give people uh, proactive insights. So the question is, are you thinking of using other sorts of data, such as smartwatches, to augment the data you're getting from your existing tests? We would love, we're not doing it yet, but we would love to start doing that. So you can imagine, like we will, that's the kind of data source, like is relatively reliable. And so I would love to start actually getting, you know, move, like I think about um, movement and sleep. Like those are some of the best, diet is really hard to get, but movement and sleep would be great. Super. Another question back there. Yes. <clears throat> Hi. Larry, um, you talked about preventative healthcare and how a lot of what 23andMe can offer is some better lifestyle changes. Mm -hmm. Lots of lifestyle changes come with pressure, positive pressure from a community. So if you go to you have active friends, you go to the gym with your friends. If you have friends that eat hamburgers, you eat hamburgers. Um, you know, simultaneously, you talked about <coughs> me building a good community of users that contribute their data. Is Are there any plans to build a more active community of, you know, People that are interested in exercising more, eating better, mm -hmm. cooking recipes, you name it, but leverage that community in some way. So the question is, are you interested in leveraging the community to change better lifestyle choices? Mm -hmm. um, I think we want to leverage community when it's really targeted towards something that's genetic or something that like it's a real insight in you. So um, for instance, saying like you're higher risk for Alzheimer's and you know, these are people in their 30s, higher risk for Alzheimer's, community of them, like what, what are, like we potentially would engage individuals to say, let's do a lifestyle intervention study and see if we can change outcomes. Um, we have community, we have forums right now on the site. Um, I think that that's an example of potentially where we would partner with groups if we felt like someone else was going to do that better than us. Like if you really want to start to exercise better or lose weight, um, there's so many other people who really are experts in that, and how, what's the right way then we could connect you. So we look at a lot of what our communities and our partnerships, it should revolve in some way based on something that's really personalized to you and ideally deal your genome. Um, so I think our, like we think about communities in that, and like in some ways like we're such a unique company, it's, there's, everyone talks about sort of diet and weight loss, but if I have, um, for instance, like very specific recommendations for you, and then there's a group of people and they're pulling in information there, that 100% I can envision a world doing. And we are specifically starting to do a bunch of wellness studies. So it would be sort of the diet and exercise, like what is it like, you know, is there a certain diet that's better for you than, you know, other people in this room? And so then you could imagine specific communities there. Great. Yes. Hi, my name is Andrew. First of all, thank you so much for um, doing this talk. It was, it's awesome. And um, my question concerns what happens when all this data is crunched. So I think it's really cool that 23andMe right now is like making drugs using this data. But down the line, as you said, I, I think it's really interesting that like theoretically the genome is like has infinite power because it, we can find out like everything about like what genes control what things. So what uh, could this pave the way towards like intelligent design? And like my question is more like. What happens to the people who can't afford 
to have 23andMe now, especially if it leads to things like intelligent design where we can make like designer babies as a result of this data. Um, because you know, people who can pay for this, they can like use their data and figure out what genes they can change to you know, imp like improve future generations because right. that theoretically is what's possible it, down the line. So I think, I think the primary question is how are you dealing with people who can't afford it mm -hmm. who would benefit uh, tremendously from having this information? Yeah, so, so, I, so I'll, I'll answer this to the aspect. Like, people who can't afford it, we do a number of programs trying to enable access. So we give away a lot of kits um, for free. We try it, like everything we can. Like right now, we have an offer. It's, you know, two kits uh, for $99 so $49 each. So we're doing as much as we can to drive down affordable price. Um, the second part in terms of, like, intelligent design and, and, and whatnot, I think there's a Gattaca world that is more science fiction than the reality. So we know, like we know CRISPR, I know cystic fibrosis, but I can't cure people yet with cystic fibrosis. So there's a long world before I'm gonna like have a you know a, you know a homogenous society of like everyone's choosing this one pheno set of phenotypes. Um, that said, like I think this is the ethical discussion. Like as like I look at 23 me part of our mission. Like I want to understand the genome. Like, I, I, like it keep, what keeps me up at night is like, we have this code in us and we don't understand it. How can everybody sleep? Like, it's just, like, I, I really, like, I, wa I really want to understand. Like, it's so interesting. And the fact that it goes back to the beginning of time, that's so cool. And so I, I, like, I want us to be the ones who are understanding and deciphering the genome. There's all kinds of ethical questions about CRISPR and how are you going to use this information? And there are realistic, you know, issues like we have that need to be discussed. But I look at our job as like I want to understand it. So I, I want to build on that because one of the concerns I've had you know, early, early in the early days, I was offered to you know participate and, and get my genome done, which I have not done yet. We'll and, give you a bit. Okay. Well, here was the issue: is I'm concerned that do we actually really understand it enough to be giving meaningful data? Am I going to like at what? The rate of knowledge in, increase of them in this world is, is super fast, mm -hmm. and we still are quite far from right. really understanding it. I mean, you're saying, how can we sleep at night because we don't understand it? And that's my concern is, we don't understand it, and am I getting information that is you know, really accurate? So, so uh, there's information. We toggle in some ways. Like, this was a regulatory question in some ways. Like, we toggled between... Oh my God, your data is so like so actionable and so scary. How could you give it to people? And then like, oh my God, you know nothing and it's meaningless. Well, I was like, you know, pick an argument, people. Like either we're too scary or we're meaningless. Um, the reality is like it's 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 the early days. Like we know cystic fibrosis mutations, and I know BRCA mutations, and I know um, you know like uh, you know some of the familiar hypocholesteremia mutations. Like there's certain mutations we feel really good about. There's an entire world in the whole genome sequencing department that makes me nervous, and it's very vus, vuses, so you know variants of unknown significance. So I might like I used to give this talk that it was you know uh, d called deleterious me. Like all when I got my whole genome, like all the different ways I should be dead, but I'm not. And so you know you start to follow my mutations. Like I had this mutation, and like I look and. You can look in some of the, you know, the genetic databases online and be like, wow, there's like all these like really terrifying diseases associated with this mutation. So to me, the fact that we don't know everything is like symbolic of life. Like we don't know everything about everything. Like it's like, but it doesn't mean we shouldn't have it. Like to me, it's like the the journey to actually starting to understand what the genome means is only going to come by starting to actually explore it. And I really, I really have this belief: like everyone can be a scientist. My dad, like my number one takeaway from the particle physicist, is that in um, in 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 1991, 1992, my dad ran something called the Superconducting Super Collider, and it got shut down by the government, and it was going to be the largest, you know, giant. Ex accelerator smasher ever. Um, and part of the reason why I got shut down is because the physicists couldn't articulate what the value proposition was. And all the scientists, like I repeat all the time, you hurt yourself by wearing the white coat and using big words and talking down to people. Of course the average population believes more in Gwyneth Paltrow than they do at anyone at Stanford because she speaks their language. 
And it's like, it drives me crazy. Like we have to empower people and be like, you know what? Be honest. We don't understand most of the genome, but you can all still understand it. And it's beautiful and it's fascinating. And the whole journey of science is the fact that we don't know. That is what inspires all of us to be scientists, is like to figure it out. It's so, it like, there's nothing better. Like my two great moments are like the birth of my children and like the results of an experiment. Did it work? Like same thing with my children, did they work? <laughs> <laughs> but like, I just think like, for me, the fact that's an unknown is the beauty of it. And like, we're all gonna solve it. And all of us, like every single person on this planet should be interested in it. It's about them. And I really, like, I really, I so want scientists to embrace this idea of, like, everyone can be a scientist. You don't need a degree. Like, we can all learn. And the more that we actually get, like, you know, the person stocking shelves at Walmart to understand CRISPR and what's happening and gravitational waves, the more we're going to get funding, the more we're all going to be connected. Like, the more we're going to actually advance society. So I really, like, to me, that's an opportunity. We don't know. And I think medicine and healthcare in general would be so much better if people actually just admit it. Like, we just don't know most of these things. We don't know most of the things of how the body works. But it's uh, job security for all those scientists, you know, and all that thrill of discovery in mm -hmm. front of us. Mm -hmm. So it's interesting because a tremendous number of students at Stanford study computer science. Mm -hmm. We know that there's the, you know, the big sucking sound of the CS department mm -hmm. as people are looking at the opportunities there. Can you talk about what you, where you see, you know, what sort of things do you think students should be studying? You know, should every student take a biology class just as they take, you know, a computer science class? What are the things that, you know, if you came out of school, you go, everyone should have this type of baseline knowledge in order to just live a fulfilling life? I mean, I'm biased, so I would say computer science is definitely, like, I wish I don't have a CS background. Like, I wish I, wish I knew more how to code. Um, I think that biology, having a basic understanding of biology, um, and the thing that I think is great, like the more people understand statistics, like I love, like one of the first <laughs> books I gave my kids was How to Lie with Statistics. Yeah. <laughs> um, just because I think it's such a great, you know, kids always start talking about, you know, numbers, and my son always quotes different stuff off the internet. And that book, there's, again, it's like a really short book, How to Lie with Statistics, and it really does a great job of just showing how numbers can be manipulated. Um, so I really, like, if I, like, my dream hires are people who are computer scientists who have, you know, a degree also then in statistics and then a degree also in biology. Um, <laughs> and I, it was funny because there was one day I was describing, I was like, I'd love to hire you someone, you know, who's like anthropology, computer science, biology, stats. And they're like, oh, Pardis? And I was like, what are you talking about? They're like, Pardis Sabetti. She's a professor at the Broad. I was like, what? And they're like, oh, and she's a rock star, too. Like she plays in a band. So there are some of these people out there. I was so surprised. And I now love this woman. Like, I spent a lot of time with her. Um, but, like, to me, that's, like, such a fascinating convergence of, like, data, you know, being able to code, um, the biology, and really understanding the numbers. And anthropology. And Long anthropology. People. Like, that's, to me, also the beauty of, like, under, like, being able to relate to people and understanding the story that's behind it. Like, that's the most interesting aspect for me of, of your genome is, like, the story. Like, why do you have these mutations? Like, I kind of love, like, people, you know, lost their dark skin for a reason. You know, like, you wanted to absorb more sun inside. Like, there's all, every mutation has a story. And that's, like, part of the beauty I want to show is, like, how we're all connected to the beginning of time and how you evolve to be you sitting here today. So let's... So let's go back in time. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm going to ask the last question. Okay. So uh, imagine you were going back to being a student, mm -hmm. and you're 20 years old. What do you wish you knew when you were 20? Um, you know, I think I think there's a lot of things that I, I again I, I I think my parents like my parents really did a great job of. Um, of encouraging us to to take to take risk and not being afraid of like trying something new and not being afraid of quitting. Like one of the hardest things in some ways is to change. Um, so when I think back on that moment of like when I graduated college and like I remember leaving, you know, getting in the car and leaving and drove cross country. I think the number one thing I would I I didn't realize is like how every single experience of my life was cumulative. Like 
every, every experience, so long as I continue to learn, everything has become meaningful in retrospect. So I can point back to, um, you know, my first boss, Marcus Wallenberg, who like then invested and, you know, has been super supportive. And like every job, even when it was sometimes painful, added, because I was still learning, it all added to my experiences today. And I think back on like, I volunteered in um, Belvedere Hospital in New York, which was like kind of a traumatic experience. But those experiences like really formed me. And, um, and I think the thing that I like, that I, my parents emphasize and that I push other people on today is always quit, like leave if you're not learning. And if you're not doing something new, if you don't feel stimulated. And I think that is, um, at that moment in time, you sort of worry as a like 30 year old, like my God, my life is like so random. Um, but I think part of it is like, eventually it all comes together. And I think it's really important to just like, the more you push yourself at some point, like there's not that pressure of like, oh, you have to figure it all out this time. But at some point the story comes together. Well, your curiosity, your passion, your drive, your enthusiasm, and of course your intelligence are incredibly inspiring. Please join me in thanking you.